vision will be tested. It will be tried. It will be put into the fiery furnace. And the question is what will come out of that fire? What will happen in your life? What will it reveal to you about yourself? And when God reveals something to you about yourself in the place of the fire, when something is evidence to you in your trial and your testing, don't deny it. This is our second Sunday of 2024. We've been speaking in 2024. We set this month for the Lord to bring us clarity and vision. That we'd not move without vision because the Bible says that where there is no clear prophetic vision my people cast off restraint and so vision is for the purpose of giving us direction vision is for the reason of giving us clarity vision is for the purpose of setting before us something that we can go after the Bible is clear that when he spoke to Abraham after Abraham and Lot had separated, he said, Abraham, as far as your eyes can see, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, that I have given you. And so I just want to present the notion that it's okay for vision to be out of reach in a moment, as long as it is not out of sight. That it's important that our eyes can see what it is we have give us what it is that the Lord desires to do in us if you cannot see it it becomes impossible to obtain that which you cannot see but if you cannot see it even though you do not know how to get to it and your hands cannot reach it as long as you can see it then there is position there is posture there is capacity for the Lord to give it to you and so it's important that we see the vision we we're talking last and such an echo we were talking last Sunday about the importance of vision, the importance of having vision and how what vision does is it gives us uh, direction and it causes us when we look at that scripture where there is no vision, by like people cast off restraints. We looked at the life of David and how David, because of the vision that God had given him through the, prof the prophecy of Samuel, because God had given him a clear prophetic vision that he was king of Israel. The Bible says that he was ordained, he was anointed king. He doesn't say he was an anointed, a future king. He was anointed king. So this is what God told him. God told him, this is who you are. He did not tell him, this is who you have the potential to be. He did not tell him, this is who you would be. Um, in 15, 20 years, he told him, this is who you are. And that when that vision came into the life of David, it changed the way he lived. It did not immediately move him into the position of kingship in the physical, but it changed his life and the way he carried himself. But even though he was still a farmer boy and he would still be working with um, his father's sheep, that he would have a new posture to the way that he engaged with the responsibilities he was given. That he carried himself as a king, taking responsibility for that which he was giving lordship over at the time. When it was sheep, he covered them and he took responsibility for them so much that even when a lion and a bear would come for them, he stood in the gap for them because that was the responsibility bestowed on him. And that was how kings carry responsibility. Kings take responsibility for the thing which they're given charge over. And so we understand why it would have been easier for him when Goliath was shouting and when the whole Israelite army were fearful because he had learned and understood who he was as king of Israel, that when somebody was speaking against the people of God, who God had given him a charge and a responsibility over, he had the ability to stand in the gap. And so the way you have vision, it gives you direction. It helps you and it forms your character. It tells you what you can do and what you cannot do. Vision rebukes you and vision restrains you. Vision gives you understanding of the kind of person and the character you ought to have. And so we had our memory verse, our first memory verse for the week. Does anybody remember what it is? Kenneth, Habakkuk 2 2. Who, who am I standing up to tell us? Timothy, the way you're looking at me is like. Timothy, memory verse for the week. All right. And the Lord said, Write the vision and make it plain on a tablet that he may run through it with that reason. Thank you.
Thank you, Kenneth, for supporting him. There was a little bit of tremor in your voice, but the words were right. Write down the vision. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Write down the vision and make it plain on tablet that he may run who sees it. And we talked about the importance of vision, clarity of vision, and then going beyond having a vision and writing it down. The Bible says that whenever God gives a word, we have to be able to bring it back to the word of God. We have to be able to look at the word of God and have something to hold on to. Because what happens is when you have a vision and the vision is general, and you've you've got your energy, you've got your zeal, you've been to a prayer meeting, you've been praying, and there's all that kind of energy. And in that moment, you're filled with faith. But the real test of anybody's faith is what happens outside of those moments, is what happens when your atmosphere isn't charged. How do you encourage yourself when circumstances around you feel like they contradict the vision? And so when you write down your vision, it gives you something. And when the vision is based in the Lord, that when you're not as charged up and you're not as full of fire and zeal in the moment because we're human beings, we're not always filled with um, that same kind of verb and energy that we have from time to time when a prophetic word is released or something like that, that you have something to hold on to. When the vision is written down, it gives you something that you can hold on to and look back on and encourage yourself in. And so when the vision is written down, it means you can always, it's like an anchor. And it's why the word of God is like an anchor. It's an anchor to our soul. Because when we go through circumstances and situations, because we will, because the Bible does not say that you will never go through hardship. In fact, the Bible promises us that as we are children of God, we will endure forms of hardship. The Bible says, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil because his rod and his staff, they comfort you. It doesn't say that because you are with the Lord, you will never have to go through dark seasons and go through circumstances and situations where tribulations come. But you need to have something that you can hold on to. And so as we talk this week, one thing the Lord has been laying in my heart has been understanding what are the next steps when it comes to having vision given from the Lord. I was talking last week, we talked about how the Bible says, count it all joy when you go through your various trials and tribulations because the testing of your faith produces patience. There's no way that vision will come from the Lord and vision will not be tested. In fact, if your vision is never tested, you can almost be certain that it is not from the Lord. There are no times and no, there's no time you look in the scripture that God gives a prophetic word and it just happens so easily. Vision will be tested. It will be tried. It will be put into the fiery furnace. And the question is what will come out of that fire? What will happen in your life? What will it reveal to you about yourself? And when God reveals something to you about yourself in the place of the fire, when something is evidenced to you in your trial and your testing, don't deny it. Because one of the easiest things we do, a lot of the times as Christians, we enter to a religious place where we just think, as long as I stand firm and believe that I am not, I, I, I can never... I can never fail or fall time. And as long as you're in denial, you cannot be brought to the place where you are developed to be who God has called you to be, to walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be. And so we cannot have a faith that means denial because what God is doing when he's building your faith is he is causing you to be fashioned after his heart. And there's a story in the Bible that just came to me this was we worshipping before I, I go to the scripture that God laid my heart. When it comes to obtaining the promises of God, the Bible says that his words are yea and amen. We know certain promises of God and about the character of God. God says, the Bible says that when he speaks, things be the Bible says in the book of Genesis that he said, let there be light, and there was light. And so the very nature, but in fact, interesting thing with that, the Bible says, let there be light, and there was light. 
And then about three or four days later, he makes the sun. And so there was light. But if man was created prior to the creation of the sun, while there would have been light, man would not have seen light. And this is the process of faith. That God creates a thing. And though our eyes can't yet see it, we must believe that it is. Because in every single thing that came to creation, he created it and then he manifested it. He created light. Then days later, he made the sun. The Bible says that he created all the, birds in the, all the birds in the air, all the fish in the sea, and all the cats on the earth. But then later on, about the fifth day or the sixth day, he formed them. The Bible says that he created man in his image. But then on the sixth day, he fashioned man out of the dust of the earth. And so it's possible that something can exist and yet we have not seen it. And that is the essence of faith. Faith is believing that when God has spoken, that thing already is, even if your eyes cannot see it. And there's a nature to God. Listen, and I were discussing during the week. We're talking about Abraham. The Bible says that we know that he did. The Bible says he never staggered in faith. But we know that there was Ishmael. So how can we say that Abraham never staggered in his faith? And it's about, there's something about the perception and the way that God sees. That God has actually called for us to be able to see in the way that he sees. The Bible says that bring up a child in the way of the Lord. Show him which way he would go. And from it he shall never depart. The Bible's focus and God's intent when we are raising children then and when we are raising people in Christ and the way that God also as a father raises us is that our focus would be on what we ought to do. That our focus should not be on what we should not do. He, he built a, a creation and a life that said, look. The Bible says, Set your eyes on that which is holy, that which is pure, that which is lovely, that which is good, that which is noble, that which is a good report. He's teaching us where your focus ought to be. That God does not see in the negative. And something about the human body is that we too, we cannot perceive things in the negative. I've used this example before. But if I were to tell you, do not think of an elephant the nature and the first thing your body or mind will do is think of an elephant. And so when you spend your time focusing on the negative, all you are actually doing is you're not really binding that thing. You are actually uh, magnifying that thing in the lens of your vision. And so when God spoke to Abraham, he did not tell him, right now you don't have kids and I'm still, I'm going to do it. I'm going to work it out. But I understand that in this process, he said, I have made you the father of many nations. He did not look at circumstance or situation. God does not look at what isn't there. He always looks at what he has already deposited. It's why when we look at David, he did not say you will one day be king. He said you are king of Israel. That the nature which God looks and desires for us to perceive and to see things is from what he has decreed and declared. But we have to fix the way we think to be able to walk in the things that God has promised and God has said. The Bible says in, in, in we all know the prodigal, we all know the, the parable of the prodigal son. Anyway, so there's this son, and he's the younger of two brothers, and he goes to his father and he says, I know that I have an inheritance in you and I want it now. Can you divide it? And the Bible says this, the Bible says. And his father divided to them all the things that he had. And so the younger brother takes that which is his own and he goes off. Now fast forward, he spends everything, wastes everything, everything is gone. And so he remembers in the pigsty that even his father's servants live better than this and he comes home. So his father says, sets up a, 
his father sets up a banquet to celebrate his, that he was lost and now he is found, that he was gone and now he's home. And his brother comes and his brother's agitated and angry when he sees all these things that are being done. And his brother goes and asks the servant what's happening. And the servant tells him that, look, your brother was lost and now he's found. Your father said a banquet. He's told us to kill the fattened calf. Brother gets angry and refuses to go into the bank, refuses to go into the father's house. His father comes to him and says, what's wrong? And he said that, look, all this time, this guy left, but you never did for me what you're doing for him now that he is back. And his father says something. He said, all that I have is yours. If you wanted them to kill the fattened calf, you would just have told them to do it. Now, this isn't even a thing of a father just saying, but it's yours. You could have done it. Anything that's mine belongs to you. What's yours is mine. What's mine is yours. The Bible says in the beginning of the story, he said that his father divided to them. And so the younger brother took what was his and the older brother, what was his, was still there. The, Bible, the father was not saying it out of just um, some form of his heart. It actually belonged to him because his father had divided them and given it to him. And so when God speaks, God has given to you. His word is enough. His word is binding. And so when you are now toiling and struggling, that why have I not had this thing that God has promised me? The Father says, it is already yours. If you wanted it, you would just have obtained it. That is the nature of God's word. That when he speaks, things are. They are set in stone. They are not a possibility. They are not a hope. They are not a wish. His words become fact. His words become reality. He said, let there be light and there was light. It might not have been visible, but there was light. What it takes is for you to get to a realm and to a level in your understanding that you would then perceive what already is. Bible says in the book of um, Hebrews chapter 5, I believe, when it's talking about uh, the promise of rest, that if what Joshua had done for the Israelites was to carry them into rest, then we wouldn't still be talking in a future day with David about the promise of rest. And so it's for us to obtain rest. And that the Israelites in Egypt were promised the same rest, but they didn't obtain it. Why? Because it had not been mixed with faith. The promise existed. And when God says a thing, it already it is binding and it is cast in stone. But the only way you can obtain of the things that God has promised you, the only way you can obtain of the vision that God has given you is by mixing it with faith that the sin of unbelief is what kept them from the promise not that the promise did not exist the promise was there for their taking but their faith was lacking and could not obtain what was freely given bible says that we we have all things by grace through jesus christ which is obtained in faith everything grace is the is the generosity of god it is all that god has given you but the only way you can take it is by the place of faith it's in the place of believing what your eyes cannot physically see but is and that we have to learn to get to a place where we are consistently encouraging ourselves in the promise of God you have to as a Christian there's a part of you that has to be honestly delusional that you have to get to that place where it does not look like it it does not look like it is possible but yea I will trust in the Lord because his words are yes and amen. What amen means, it is a bind, it is you saying that you are in agreement with the word of God, that you are standing with the word of God. You sneak that, you make that become your foundation. The thing on which you live, the thing on which you make your decisions. David was learning to carry himself like a king, yea, though he was not yet a king. But his posture, carried him to become what God has said because when God had promised it he believed that he was it and when he believed it he carried himself like it and when he carried himself like it he became it I was telling you this I was supposed to do a quiz today and I was to ask you who was king of Israel after Saul anybody know the answer to that huh Praise, I said, David. Anybody else? Anybody else? 
Okay, praise. See all this confusion that we're doing within ourselves. Open up your Bibles, guys. Open up your Bibles. Okay, so what happens is just before Saul is still king, Saul is trying to kill David. You can't say his name, but we got there. Thank you. Because we have we have pictures in our minds and we don't spend enough time sitting in the word. A natural assumption will be the next king after Saul was David. Because we only think ah, the only person that was in the way of David becoming king was Saul now. David did not become king until he was the third king of Israel. Right? But the reason I'm bringing this up is God had ordained him and anointed him. Imagine, I don't know how you might feel. If you feel like the only obstacle in your way is this one man that's trying to kill you, the guy finally dies and they still anoint somebody else king. And then oh, that's when I start looking back to the like, well, you said something now and I don't understand it. But David had something to hold on to that he had the character and the charisma and, the, and he carried himself with the idea of being a king. It's why David, before Saul dies actually, because David was king for seven years of Judah. So about five years before Saul dies, the people of Judah, while they are part of Israel, they come to David and they're like, we recognize who you are. We recognize your authority. We recognize the way you love and you have compassion and you care for your people. You are our king. And so he becomes the king of Judah. But that's not the promise. But it is that taste of the promise that encourages his heart. And so when Saul dies, his son is but whatever. Yeah, that, that name, right? <laughs> becomes king of Israel. He's the anointed king of Israel. And he's only king for two years because he, he moves mad. And in that time, he goes and engages, continues the same war of his father and tries to kill David. He engages in war with David people. But when there are people who he sends to war with David, that as they are going, they fear David. Because they have understanding of what it is that David carries. And so some of them come, they say to David, look here, I don't know what this guy is doing, but we see who you are. We see that you are not even just king of Judah, but you are king of Israel. We see the spirit of God on you. So eventually Ishbosheth dies and David is ordained king. But that sign of what happens with David and the people of Judah is a mark to the fact that he was somebody who became king before he was king. Because people, the Bible says, let your light so shine so that men will come so the light will shine. That is because David was carrying himself that even though there was not a legal, there was not a nation, Judah was not a nation, it was simply a city and a town. People had to separate themselves and say, we want to follow this guy. Because his posture, he walked in promise. He walked in who God had said he was before his eyes saw it. And we have to learn to walk in the reality of the promise before the promise becomes a reality. We have to understand and hold on to vision so passionately. So the next part of Habakkuk 2.2, uh, after Habakkuk 2.2, it's going to be our memory verse for this week. Verse 3 and 4. So I'm just going to read it quickly. It says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the time at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. What this scripture is pointing us to is that there is no promise in God that will not manifest itself. 
the problem is that the, there is a signed sealed time for the promise to come to pass and a lot of the time we think of that time as delay so the bible goes on to say that though it tarries it will surely come and that delay sometimes it is chronological so if you look at the life of the Israelites the Bible says that God had spoken to Abraham and told them how long they would be in captivity in Egypt he had decreed a thing and so there was a passage of time that needed to happen in order for that word to come to pass and then if you even go and look now the reason does anyone know the reason why the Israelites were in Egypt for as long as they were in captivity anybody pardon does anyone know the reason that the Israelites were in captivity apart from Elysia <laughs> anybody yeah why the the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt for as long as they were. Anybody? Hmm? No. It is, do you know that the way God, because what happens, you'll be in captivity, you don't think that it's something that I did. Meanwhile, God has said, he wants to give you a land. But he cannot justify taking the land away from these people until their sin is enough. So they were sitting there in captivity, being beaten. And there are things that God, but when, when Job was, when Job had got to the place of frustration, he went, finally went to God and said, I don't understand what's happening. Why is all these things happening to me? The Bible says that God opened his eyes and God showed him the entirety of the universe. God showed him how he had numbered even the grains of sand on the beach. God showed him how he had everything was intentional. The Bible said that he showed him that even the beasts that kill people in one fell swoop, they are all in accordance with him. And so Job had gone to God like, this is not fair. That's not justice. This isn't just. Because we are selfish human beings. When we look at justice, we look at it from our perspective. God said he looks at everything. And he weighs everything. And he's a just God. And so when you are looking from the lens of your own problem, you think this isn't fair. This isn't right. God has weighed it all. And so there's a process of time that has to take place for the vision to manifest itself. And sometimes it is chronological. Sometimes it's because God said this thing will happen for 400 and so years. Sometimes it is because the delay is God fashioning you to become the person that can walk in the promise. Because what good is a promise? The Bible says that what, is, what, what, what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? And so if your focus is simply on the promise of God, simply on the fact that God, God told you that he's going to, to, to make you um, the president of Nigeria. I don't know who wants to be that, but right now, trust you. And you're looking at circumstances saying, why is it not manifested itself? Why is it not happening? And you don't realize that the problem is, the reason that God will keep you from that seat is because that seat will kill you if you have not become the person that you need to be to sit in the chair. I once listened to, I think T.D. Jake said that the one thing you can do to destroy anybody in ministry is to give them the key to his church. Because unless they have built the character and gone through the things, they don't know how to sit in the chair. And too often we're looking at the promise and thinking God is withholding it from us because he's not faithful. But he's withholding it from you because what matters to him more than anything is who you are, not what you are. It's not what you have, it's not the person, it's not the people around you, it's not the amount of money you account. The thing that's most valuable to God is the integrity of your character. So when you're looking at, at, at Joseph and the problems and the things that Joseph waded through and had to go through. I always use the example that Joseph, he had gone through process and he was seeing elements of character in his capacity. But the final test that Joseph had was when the baker and the, and, and the cup bearer were in his house, were in the prison. And they finally, he gives the revelation and um, the cup bearer, is the cup bearer that gets taken out? Or the baker? The baker. And the baker is going, and the baker is being released out of prison. And, the ba and he tells the baker, remember me. 
It's a, see, I knew it was the cop I said the cop first to. No, I was like taken out of prison, taken out of captivity. I, I didn't say it with that kind of edge. I don't understand, you guys. You know these people that are operating as gangsters. Calm down. <laughs> so he tells the cop bearer, remember me. That's so when the cop bearer is taken out of prison. He tells him, remember me. And that was one of the final tests that Joseph needed to still go through because it revealed that he was still trying to bring himself out. He was still trying to solve his own problem. There was still an element of his character that had not yet been dealt with. Because he doesn't just say, remember me. He tells him, and so because what the way I was brought to this country was not fair. I was illegally brought here as a slave. And so he's still like, if you look at that from that perspective, that means that if the cupbearer remembered him and brought him out to prison, the first thing he wanted to do was get himself out and go to Israel. He did not realize that his promise was in Egypt, that his purpose, where God was calling him. And so often, so I, I, I literally have always wondered, why is it that God is talking about how the vision does not tire will surely come to pass? And then the next part of the scripture is for the pride, the, the, the proud, their heart is not upright in them, but the justified, they live by faith. So when you are proud, you are trying to, you're, you, in your mind, you can solve every problem. And so, the problem with proud people is that they are trying to work in accordance to their own wisdom. And so they're trying to fashion the vision with their hands as opposed to fashioning the vision on their knees. And that kind of person can never obtain the vision. And as long as you are living as somebody who is trying to force the vision with your own hands, you'll be watching it tiring and complaining. Not knowing that God is working something in you. That's why the Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He submits yourself to the Lord. Be submitted to Him. And there's some of us here who think, ah, but I've submitted and it hasn't yet happened. The fact that you had that thought means you have not submitted. Because there are too many people, that we, what we do is we submit ourselves, you know, that's why I always talk about the scripture that says, um, all things, um, you know, not that, but the scripture that says that, um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added on to them. If you are seeking them simply for the, as a strategy for the things to be added on, you are not seeking God. Because God, the Bible says, that the word of God is as sharp as a two-edged sword, able to decipher between the intentions of your heart, between bone and marrow and the intentions of the spirit. That means God sees your intention even when you don't see your intention. And so until you submit yourself to him, you cannot have your heart fashioned in a manner that can achieve the promises of God in your life. The sooner you submit your heart to God, the sooner your eyes will held on the promise. So he says, the justified, the righteous people, they live by faith. They don't live by what their eyes see. They don't walk in accordance to um, what people are saying and what circumstances they're looking at. The way they fashion every aspect of their life is that if he said it, it is. That the, the thing that they walk by continually is faith in the promise of God. That is who we need to become. It says, and Alicia quoted it earlier, that it is in, without faith it is impossible to please God. There is one grave sin that keeps a man from heaven. There's a one grave sin that keeps man from obtaining the things of God. The Bible says that the sin of unbelief is what kept the Israelites from the promise. You cannot obtain what you do not believe exists. And so the moment you are walking and living your life in doubt or outside of faith and promise of God, it means that you don't have the finances required to acquire it. The finance of faith is what purchases the promise of grace. Now, I cannot tell you today this thing will happen in your life tomorrow. But what I can tell you from this scripture 
is that it is worth the wait. Whatever God has promised you is worth the wait. God has decreed in your life it is worth the wait. He says, hold on to the promise. Yea, though it tarries, it will surely come to the end. It will surely come to pass. And it will not tarry. And you wonder why is it? You know, the word translates are two different things. The first time it says tarry, the word is delay. Because it's perspective. We think that God has delayed it. When it says it will never, it will, it will not tarry, it is telling you that that thing that God, it can never be late. It will always be on time. It might not be on your time, but it will be on time. When God's promise manifests in your life, it might take that moment for you to look back and realize I couldn't handle it then. I wasn't who I needed to be then. The prayer is that God make us who we need to be. Help my heart align with you. Help my heart be submitted to you. It's why Job was able to become the kind of person that would say, Yea, though he slay me, I will trust him. Until you have that kind of heart, how can God trust you? The Bible says that that story of, of Job, God, before his eyes had seen, before Job had gone through the testing, God could stand and speak for Job. God is the one that went to Satan and said, Have you looked at my son Job? He is an upright man. He could vouch for the kind of character Job had. So even though he didn't say that about didn't say that about Job's people around Job, he didn't say that about Job's wife. So when she's saying, curse God and kill yourself. Because she didn't have the character, but Job had something about him. He had a testament in his life to the fact that he trusted God above all else. He valued God above all things. When the Bible says, the final thing I'll say, when the Bible says that if anybody wants to come after Jesus, he must... No, that's not the scripture. It's why I was like, I started misquoting it, you know, but we'll get there, we'll get it right. But the Bible says that, okay, I'll put it in my own words, but you can find it in the Bible, right? When, when the Bible says that you must hate your father and your mother, he's not telling you to have contempt against them. He's telling you a list of your priorities, God must be number one. And so even when you're looking at the promise of God, you can hunger and thirst after all. But that thing, you must be ready to kill it. in the place of God. If you desire the promise more than the giver of the promise, you are in error. And it is often one of the greatest causes of delay to receiving the promise of God is that you lost after it as opposed to hunger and thirsting after God. There are things that we desire in this life and God wants to give them to you. But God's value system prioritizes that you have a cultivated relationship with Him above all else. Because God's heart for you is not things. God loves you. He doesn't love the things you have. He doesn't love your position in society. He doesn't love any of that. He loves you. And so he's looking for people that will love him like he loves them. That will love him above anything on the earth. That will love him more than the promise. That will love him more than the acclaim. Abraham did not turn to God and say, I want to be famous. God turned to him and said, I will make you famous. Because Abraham did not desire fame. He desired God enough to go to leave everything he knew to go to a place that he did not know. God rewards people whose hearts are for him. That's why he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If that is the priority of your life, I will freely give you all these things.